Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House. And entering into the Fun House as we speak, he's clicking all the Zoom boxes right now. Mr. Martin Popoff, what's up, Martin? How are you? Yeah, doing okay, doing okay. Looking forward to this. I mean, we've got a bit of a grab bag, I think, with this one, which is kind of interesting. We haven't uh, done done more unlike this uh you know before too many times but uh yeah on this cold almost wintry day here in toronto ready to roll wintry day wow i think it's uh i think it's going to hit 80 here today and we're expecting lots of rain this afternoon but it's sun shining oh, yeah. not many clouds in the sky right now so all's yeah. good in the hudson valley here so all right so yeah as martin mentioned we've got a little bit of a grab bag episode so we have uh one topic which was actually suggested by one of our viewers ben i'm going to actually read you his email to me in just a second uh, we've also got uh, two other things we're going to talk about. Martin was at a very spectacular event yesterday that he's going to kind of fill us in on. And uh, I've also got something else I want to kind of get off my chest. And we're going to do that uh, as well. So uh, without further ado, let me read you Ben's email. Ben, and I thank you for reaching out to me. So Ben said, uh, and and again, I'll, I'll let me tell you what we're going to title this episode. Well, you've already seen the title here, but it's, this is all about why aren't frog fans as open-minded as metal fans that's kind of the title of the episode as you can see here on youtube but the reason why we're doing this is because ben asked uh he's a longtime viewer from massachusetts uh, i have an interesting proposal for a show with you and martin the basic question is what is the connection or overlap between heavy metal and progressive rock at first glance, these two genres have little in common, but when you dig deeper, there is a huge affinity between the fan bases, and many fans of both genres, like yourself, and many of the audience listen to both. I have some thoughts personally about the link between prog and metal, epic structures, complex playing, neoclassical inspirations, etc., but I'd love to hear from the both of you, Martin and others on the channel, why these two genres gel together so well, and let me know what you think. So, Ben, thank you so much for uh, writing in and... Uh, inquiring about this so martin and i decided we're going to tackle this we've each kind of picked out three kind of bands or subsets of bands to kind of talk about to explain why there is an overlap what about the music of these bands can appeal to both and in some instances why one audience is more acceptable for the other uh, than the other and and we'll we'll talk about that quite a bit so with all that being said i'll have martin uh kind of kick us off add a little color here and uh, I'll talk about an event he just attended yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll include the event in uh, the event in the second one, but I want to start with one that's a little more of a, of an awkward one. And it's, and it's one way of looking at this topic, like, like Pete says, you know, we've got, um, we, you know, e each one of these, uh, represents the concept in a different way. And we thought, you know, what bands, uh, will cover all bases sort of this. So I wanted to start with, uh, just say a little bit about Hawkwind. There's my Hawkwind book. You can get that at martinpopoff.com. Big, massive coffee table book. There's a classic Hawkwind album. Yep. Um, so, you know, we, we thought this was an interesting band um, that skirts the edges of crossover here. You know, you've got Pro Prague uh, sometimes goes into this realm called space rock sort of thing. And Hawkwind is one of these bands where I think you do get the fan bases from, from both areas, from the Prague and the metal people. I mean, Hawkwind, you know, to describe the band, uh, it, they're very hard to describe, but it's Definitely. almost like, it's almost like they've got repetitive structures. It's a little, it's a little, um, it's a little kind of hypnotic, repetitive, almost punky on the on the rhythm section and guitar end of things. But they've always been throughout this vast catalog, huge explorers of uh, keyboard and synthesizer technology. So that's almost where you get more of the prog than anything else. You get the prog also in the psychedelicness and it again you know leaning into the whole space rock thing you've got the um the prog crazy light shows sound shows you know linking back to the the early days of pink floyd kind of thing um so so th this is one of these where um i think you get the open mindedness from both camps being into them but i think still you know as per the title of our of our uh, this episode and the theme I I generally see that there are more metalheads that like Hawkwind than there are prog people that like Hawkwind. Um, even though you would think they should be pretty equal, um, I think the metal people like them because there is also the the stoner rock aspect to it as well, right? I mean, there's the Lemmy factor. 
Exactly. There's a Lemmy factor as well. So everybody loves Lemmy. Lemmy was in the band earlier on. Uh, and then he's, uh, you know, famously kicked out of the band for, for, for his drug bust, basically crossing into Canada uh, situation. Um, so there is that factor. And then of course there, there, uh, there becomes a large sort of stoner rock genre coming up later, but obviously one of the big bands or the most famous band that is the most Hawkwind, like you got monster magnet that comes up and that's squarely into the metal camp as well. I mean, on the prog end, you've got the, uh, you know, the, the, the spacey awesome album covers the Barney bubbles artwork hypnosis even did one, uh, one album for them, cork strangeness and charm only one, which is kind of odd. Um, but, uh, but yeah, long songs, you know, crazy sort of stories, abstract lyrics, uh, you know, sprawling catalog. Um, so they're, so they're definitely in both, but, um, yeah, I, so, th so this one's just kind of almost like a little asterisk off to the side, this whole space rock thing. You know, we, we talk about UFO and space rock. They weren't really space yeah. rock on those early, they were tried to claim that title, but basically this is the big space rock fans, uh, band. So, um, you know, prog fans, are they not so into Hawkwind because the productions are often a little substandard. It's not proggy when it comes to, I mean, you know, time signatures and complexity. Yeah, it's usually pretty four, four pounding punk rock, hardcore heavy metal when it's heavy at all and otherwise it's just regularly pretty four four um but as we say the the progginess i think uh is almost more from the from the whole keyboard point of view as well so this is a band that helped yeah and you know like that. The, the albums that feature like mellotron all of this those are always the favorites of the of the hardcore prog fans right so and yeah. the, the more like the 80s the more rocking hawkwind albums generally get bypassed by a lot of the prog crap mm -hmm. yeah all right Cool. Yeah, there's something about the whole space rock thing that I think always has appealed to to metal fans. Like I know, like like Eloy is another example of a band that kind of the, the fine line between what is prog and what is space rock, right? That Eloy is a perfect example there. But most metal fans that I know really like Eloy a lot, and again because it kind of fits into that weird group with a Pink Floyd and with a Hawkwind, right? Which I think most metal fans kind of like that kind of stuff. So maybe that has to do with the whole kind of trippy psychedelic stoner attitude or ambiance that surrounds these bands, which is appealing to metal fans. Who knows? Yes. All right. So a band we talk about obviously quite a bit here on the channel, but they are probably the first band that I thought of when we talked about doing this and that's Rush, right? Rush, the, the little band that doesn't really fit anywhere, but yet fits in all of these places, Right. Uh, you know, the early albums, there's no no prog going on here at all. This is just a really good bluesy, heavy rock album. Uh, but then they start to incor incorporate little bits of proggy moments here with you know, albums like, like that and albums like that. All of a sudden, longer songs, complex time signatures, which the prog audience loves. But yet the music in the 70s is still really, really heavy. Uh, it's amazing like how many like metal fans and prog fans just you know totally worship this band maybe the one band that truly is the meeting of both of these groups that we're talking about here uh and then you know as you know 2112 comes into play and certainly these two albums which most prog fans cite as the two most progressive rush albums they're still damn heavy right but really complex gorgeous productions lots of intricate playing you know you got these three virtuosos and then as we move on, maybe less of the heavy metal bombast, a little more prog, straightforward arrangements as they move into the 80s with albums like this and ones that come after, which then, you know, and, and here's the interesting part of this. The hard rock and metal fans are turned off by that, but yet the prog fans fully embrace the technology use of technology and moving into different territories in the 80s and it's interesting i think like some i've heard i've talked to many <clears throat> prog fans who musically like rush but don't like his vocals the getty's vocals a little too screechy a little too too metally for a little too much like robert plant right um but i think that rush has this has had this ability no matter what the era is where i think even like 
because uh, I do talk to like some extreme metal fans who don't listen to a lot else and they appreciate Rush. They're open-minded to Rush. Maybe not the whole catalog, but most of the catalog. But a lot of prog fans will pick specific albums that they really like from the band and some, some, some that they just really don't or they never listen to or they just stop listening to them after a certain time. So I think that the debate of, of Rush on how proggy they are, how metal they are, or does it really even matter will be debated for years and years and years. But I think that this is another example, kind of like Hawkwind, where both sides usually can come into an agreement that Rush is an okay band to like, no matter which camp you're in. And I think they always will. But again, the un unlike Hawkwind, where the majority of the catalog is kind of similar, maybe little deviations, Rush has all these clear eras where the sound is quite different and people generally will poke in and out of one or the other to pick as their favorite or the one that they follow or the one that they remain loyal to so i'll stop there martin i don't know if you want to add yeah anything. the the i th i think the interesting thing here is that um you know the overlap to answer answer uh, ben's question um the overlap uh was rare in the old days because here's rush you know, quote unquote, uh, inventing the idea of progressive metal. I mean, you might you might throw a little King Crimson in there, a little Sticks, maybe a little Kansas. But there's this one band that that, you know, is considered, you know, I, I maybe partly because I say it all the time, but, they, you know, being the inventors of progressive metal and kind of the only band doing this up until your Queen's Rikes and Fate's Warning sort of thing. But also the other interesting thing I, I think that you see happening just the same way as uh, bands that were called heavy metal bands in the old days are now called classic rock or hard rock bands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Rush all through the seventies was chucked into the hard rock camp and people did not call them a progressive rock band no. at all. No. Now they're only called a progressive rock band. Um, yeah. They're not called a heavy metal band or a hard rock band at all. They're literally squarely. I mean, if you're, if you're under 40, say, um, they're just considered a progressive rock band because heavy metal has gotten so much heavier over the years that that despite the fact that, um, you know, I've often called Rush, they're just yes with a distortion pedal on. Right. Um, you know, despite them having electric guitar most of the time with a yeah. fuzz pedal, um, they're they're literally now just considered a progressive rock band. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you also. Pete, that you know this this is the one band uh the most out of all of them where they come together and uh and literally the band itself is coming together and you know confusing your concept of what is well they, they tick a lot of the boxes right you know like virtual some musicianship check that's something that you see in both categories here right um they the lyrics are highly intellectual sci-fi fantasy driven for the most part check boxes on both sides because you see that both in yeah. prog and metal um but what's interesting when you go back in the day it's like you're absolutely right i think back in the day they were considered too heavy for prog and now yeah. it's almost like they're too prog for heavy so it's weird yeah. how it's changed like over the years yeah. or it, it hasn't the music hasn't changed it's our perception of it. And now we have this whole catalog to look at. Whereas back in the seventies, we just had those early albums and let's face it. Those albums are pretty damn heavy for back yeah. then. Now, maybe not so much. Yeah. And you bring up a good point. I mean, you, you, you know, we're talking about, you know, the crossover between prog and metal, all the, all your favorite metal, uh, you know, performers in the eighties rush were their main teachers. So, yeah. so they were learning from this progressive metal band to make metal. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody, yeah, all all the players revered Rush, and and it was it was literally their their school textbooks. You yep. know, uh, you know, especially if you were a drummer or a bass player, more more than anything, right? Yeah, um, you sure. know, you were buying the kits like Neil's. You know, you wanted that big kit, you wanted all that stuff. It made you get percussion and bells and all that sort of thing, the tune toms. Um, so yeah, that was a big thing, and and yeah, definitely. Um, you think of um. So yeah, the virtuosity from that, it you know, from prog, but spe specifically this prog metal band feeds all of the virtuosity of the metal bands later, and certainly with the lyrics as well, it comes in. So uh, all right, so my second choice, um, it's Martin Popoff Book Day here. Pink Floyd, we've got the uh, the brand new Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon. 
uh, book as well. But I'm bringing up Pink Floyd because number one is the main one I wanted to talk about with this topic. But fortunately, um, also, I wanted to give a little mini review of this event I went to yesterday with Tim Anderson. Uh, so it was great seeing Tim again for Brave Words. Um, but um, so downtown of the Exhibition Gardens here was the the media event launch of the uh, of the new Pink Floyd Museum show called Their Mortal Remains. And uh, you get there. Yeah, so it's right in the exhibition grounds, which is where, you know, the CNE is. It's right next to BMO Field where the Toronto Argonne play and the uh, and our MLS team um, so there's all these buildings around and there's the big you know uh, kind of carnival festival with rides and all that every summer but um, so it was it was pretty cool so it's it's held there and and there were these speakers and and even the guy from the CNE uh, and Dave Marsden uh, you know legendary radio guy came up and told the stories as well but um, so Pink Floyd played I think he said Pink Floyd played the CNE grounds like seven times over the years. Right. And, uh, and you know, they, they got a lot of their early, like they were here for dark side of the moon. They, um, there were a lot of other connections like, um, so Michael Cole was one of the speakers. He's one of the most famous promoters of all time, famous for putting on the steel wheels tour and all that. So, so he spoke and, and, uh, him and Marsden had these fond memories of how, um, uh, you know, Michael, David Marsden uh, told Michael Cole, you know, there's this band Pink Floyd, you know, why don't you try to put them on? I'll, I'll put out a petition, see how many tickets we could sell. And so he went on the radio show and, and started doing all this. And Michael Cole was saying, you know, to him, threatening him to kind of say, and, uh, you know, if, if this doesn't sell, I'm going to remember your last name is Marsden, right? I'm going to make light <laughs> hell for you kind of thing. Uh, so, um, he's kind of kidding around in their buddies and, um, and, uh, so, so David tells the story of like, he's, he's back after one of his night shifts, sleeping at 10 30 in the morning. And Michael Cole phones him up, tell him, you know, it's sold out uh, at Maple Leaf Gardens. I think he said it was so, um, you know, and this is just before dark side of the moon uh, came out. Um, so he, David goes at that point, I knew Pink Floyd was going to be huge. And they also talked about how they had a, they had a concert in Hamilton down the road at Iverwind stadium. It might have been called Hamilton, Hamilton Tiger Cats. No, I think it was still called Ivor Wynn at that point, but it's where the Hamilton Tiger Cats play. And uh, and there was some big crazy pyro thing at the end where the guy loaded up all the pyro and blew it up on the top of the stadium and actually knocked down the um, uh, the, the big scoreboard. And there was all this stuff. And he's and Roger Waters got in a fist fight with some some roadie or something in, 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 in the back. And and he cut his foot and they had to take him to a, the emergency room. And there was all this going on at the same time that the whole scoreboard. He said nobody was hurt because the scoreboard came down and plunked into the ground straight, straight down and didn't fall over kind of thing. Eh? But, yeah, they're paying them up, people off with pot and 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 uh money and all this sort of stuff so so they're telling all these stories of all this but the other cool thing about this so so we had david marsden we had michael cole bob ezrin spoke bob ezrin was there and i got to meet bob and uh got a picture with him and stuff and um and I've, I've interviewed Bob a few times over the years, but I've never talked about Pink Floyd. It was cool hearing these stories about him, but he talks about, um, he talked about how, um, you know, uh, Roger came to him about this whole thing about feeling alienated uh, about the crowd and saying, I've got this idea, you know, we should build a wall in front of them. And Bob says, oh, that's a great idea and all this. And, and so later on they were, they were working it and, um, and Roger came to him and, and he says, I've got these two ideas, which one should we do? He's got, he, he came to him with Pink Floyd, the wall, and he came to him with uh, the pros and cons of hitchhiking. Right. And, and Bob says, well, this, this is the good one. We got to do this one, the wall. So Bob ended up producing the wall. He produced momentary lapse of reason, division bell. Um, so that was cool. Bob spoke. And then also at this thing. So Bob isn't really that involved in putting together what this is. So this is the Pink Floyd Museum show. I'll get to that in a sec. But the two guys involved are Michael Cole, you know, as, as this big promoter, and then Aubrey Powell. Bo Poe, um, you know, one half of the hypnosis team, Storm Thorgerson died a little while ago, but Poe was there and that was cool. I got to do a little interview with Poe and, and all that. And we listened to Poe talk and it was really cool to hear him uh, get up there. And he was like sort of flabbergasted at how many Toronto connections there were to Pink Floyd. One I forgot to mention is when they were rehearsing for the momentary lapse of reason tour, they rehearsed that in a, in a uh, airport hangar out at the, uh, 
you know, the Toronto airport uh, and to talk, you know, as, as this episode's about prog and prog metal, that's, that's Y, Y, Z. Right. Um, so uh, that's the call letters for that airport. So anyway, so Pink Floyd, I rehearsed there and they had the hangar doors open and crew were coming to watch them and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the, uh, what else did he, oh yeah. Bob Ezrin said that uh, the, um, the famous part uh, in the wall where the, the girls saying, are all these your guitars want to take a bath? That whole thing was recorded right in Yorkville in Toronto. Cause Bob, Bob was kind of work. He says 89 Hazleton Avenue, you know, in Yorkville. So that was kind of cool. Um, so that was great. So, um, so yeah, we had this nice press conference, big pig out front, the big fat man from the show inside, you know, was blown up in there. Uh, and then you see the museum show and it's uh, it's basically it was, it was like the Rolling Stones and, and the Bowie one. And by the way, uh, Bowie, um, I think Poe uh, uh, was involved in putting together the Bowie one as well, which is kind of cool. And I don't think they ever did any covers for Bowie. I'm not sure. Hypnosis. But anyways, um, so so the show had all this stuff, um, you know, the usual stuff. There was, you know, handwritten lyrics and, uh, you know, drawings, uh, all the instruments, a lot of guitars, basses, Nick Mason's drum set with the with the waves on it, the Japanese wave pattern. They had the big division bell, um, you know, uh, sculpture thing, which I, you know, I remember seeing that thing was seemed like an almost permanent fixture down at the Hall of Fame, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so so all that kind of stuff, kind of a concert weird thing at the end, which was kind of cool. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, but, you know, one of the stories um, uh, Poe said was, was um, you know, as they were looking for things, they went back to the old school that uh, I think it was, uh, who did he say? It was Storm, Roger. Oh, I'm forgetting who the third person was. Anyways, three of them were together. Maybe it was... Uh, Anyways, th three of them were together in school and, uh, and, and they found the caning book uh, that, that said, you know, who's getting a caning on what day, right? Because, you know, the, the school masters would whack them with a cane, right? They found the teacher and the teacher says, I actually still have that old cane. Um, so they actually put the cane in the show. And, and Poe says when he was walking through the show at the Victoria and Albert, which is where it started, the big museum in London, just like the Bowie. Um, he says, Roger was almost in tears, you know, looking at the, at the, at seeing the actual cane and stuff, because that figured so prominently in the teacher in the wall. And, yeah. and, you know, I've, I've interviewed lots, probably I've had seven or eight rock stars tell me about, you know, being traumatized by, by being beaten in school. Right. And, and bullying in school and the whole, yeah, the whole elementary school system over there. Um, but yeah, so, so that's in there. They, they put the actual cane in the show and then, you know, it showed, you know, all the times these, these three guys were all, all getting cane. So uh, yeah. And finding, you know, he says they have multiple warehouses all over the place full of stuff and they were pulling stuff out of there and blowing things up and finding out they still worked and stuff. So yeah, the, the whole museum show. So, uh, so that was a cool event. Um, yeah, yeah. Sounds like it. But yeah, to get back to this episode, um, I think Pink Floyd is a really good choice here. Um, and it's the first one I sort of thought to mind uh, that came to mind um, with this whole thing of the overlap in that a Absolutely not a heavy band. One of the quietest bands you'll ever hear. Um, quietest, laid back, clean, uh, you know, clean guitar tones, simple drumming, simple keyboards. Um, but the point is, um, you know, I did these a long time ago, 20 years ago. I did these top 500 al heavy metal albums of all times and heavy metal songs of all times books for ECW Press here in Toronto. And uh, so I took a massive poll to get these answers. And darn it if so many people didn't vote for Pink Floyd, right? All these metal people or people, they're just people. But the question was, what are the top 500 heavy metal albums of all time? And they're voting for animals and the wall and dark side constantly, right? It's like, so that I found really illuminating. There's a lot of Bowie as well that people voted for, which is kind of odd. But so Pink people Floyd- seem to make every excuse. And, and I, I love the fact you mentioned <laughs> Bowie there too, that Pink Floyd and Bowie is heavy music. Yeah, yeah. And it's and, like, and, and so even though all the characteristics of what we think is heavy, neither one really has, there is this perception- maybe the impact of their songs and their albums is perceived as heavy. Yeah. So, so they're thinking even deeper and more abstractly. And when you start pushing back and talking with them, they start bringing that kind of stuff up. It's like, well, it's emotionally and it's dark and the lyrics are heavy, but yeah. So the interesting thing here is that um, 
a lot of metal fans love Floyd, you know, unapologetically, it's just almost like expected, um, you, you know, and, and no matter how heavy metal a fan you are, you love Floyd and they're just not heavy at all. Um, and prog fans love Floyd as well. And the, and the other funny thing uh, that mm. happens with all this is uh neither camp uh, will claim them as uh, as one of theirs because because they're not really a prog band they're always kind of left out of that conversation a little bit and they're certainly not a heavy metal band but they're but they're loved um you know and again i think this is almost like um again goes to our theme that uh that the metal heads seem to be more open-minded than the prog fans in that more 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 metal heads love lots of prog than more prog fans love lots of uh lots of metal um and yeah like, like i say pink floyd is so loved by them but but are they a progressive rock band that's just a, a debate that goes forever as well yeah i mean i'm glad you brought that up because uh i've been doing this series all month long here in june where i'm talking about my 30 favorite prog rock albums of the 70s right so of course i've got some pink floyd on my list and it's interesting how probably 90 percent of the viewers also have been picking Pink Floyd and absolutely agree that Floyd is a prog band and one of the most beloved out there. But yet there's this small audience of people who, you know, we like to, whether it's good or bad to say this, but there are, there's some snobbery going on in the, in the, the, the prog rock fandom. And there, there's a, a bunch of people who <clears throat> don't feel that any Pink Floyd album is really a progressive rock album that it's more mainstream rock and that the early stuff is psychedelic and that, you know, even as great as album as dark side of the moon or wish you were here or animals or the wall or any of that stuff, as great as those albums are, doesn't even come close to being what they feel is progressive rock. Right. Yeah. So there's this whole like labeling thing that seems so important to so many people. Uh, you know, and again, we, we talked about just rush a couple minutes ago. We talked about Hawkwind to these, to this subset of progressive rock fans, those three bands aren't prog at all, right? Because it has to have these certain qualities and characteristics of the music to be called prog, I guess. Yeah. And by the way, yeah, just to just to complete this is like, okay, so they are considered prog because they can be conceptual. That's a big thing. And then the album covers, and one of the things they did at the show yesterday or this press conference, the, the actual show starts to the public today. So it was like a one day before it actually starts. It's here for a bunch of months can't remember where they say it's going next it was in montreal before london before but anyway so so the other thing they did is they played a trailer to the new hypnosis movie um which i've seen the whole movie uh have you seen the whole movie no yeah it's uh well the, the trailer kind of gives you an idea of what's going on and i said this to poe as as well you know he, we were he was talking about the movie and i said the crazy thing about that movie is is no one and said no to you because and then he says he goes you know what martin um my whole life uh, my whole career no one has ever said no to me uh you know and so the whole hypnosis say it's it's funny it's like they got to do everything they wanted to do no yeah. one ever said no but the cool thing about the movie is you've got robert plants in it jimmy page is in it paul mccartney's in it roger waters uh dave gilmore i mean basically everybody i don't think anybody they asked said no uh, to to be in this and uh, you know to to extol the glories of hypnosis, but that was really cool. And the movie is amazing. I I got to go on an, an NPR thing and talk about the movie. They they interviewed me for an hour and a half about the movie a couple weeks ago or last week. So uh, so yeah, it was it was um, the movie is definitely worth seeing uh, because it is it's Cadillac. It's like it's like hypnosis and all that money they spent on those album covers and traveling to go and that's all <laughs> talked about in it. But it's the movie is as Cadillac as they got to be in their career and obviously as pink floyd got to be making all their music and all their graphics too yeah i mean it's, it's an interesting story the whole hypnosis thing i mean it, you know in many cases they work directly with the artists themselves to conceptualize what the album cover is supposed to look like but i think like as the 70s wore on they had this nice backlog of of uh, album cover creations that like you know a band came to them and say hey we want to use you guys well, here's what we got available. Oh, no, you can't have that one because Black Sabbath's already called for that one. You can have this one. Okay, we'll take it. They'll take whatever they can get, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the 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 famous, uh, that there's a even a part in the trailer about that, the famous leftovers box, right? And, and Paul exactly. McCartney, the whole lobster story, right? Lobster on a leash. 
<laughs> he goes, yeah. oh, I'll have to talk to somebody about that. That was pretty funny in the trailer. But yeah, in, incredible movie. So it was great to see Poe there and uh, and Bob Ezrin and, uh, you know, and, and going through this show. But yeah, it's uh, it, it was it, like I say, I mean, honestly, I would say it wasn't the best of the three I've seen. I would say the Rolling Stones one was. And oh, really? Was yeah. Massive. It was really, really big. And they and as I, I remember talking about it on the show, they, they put it out of town. They put it, uh, you know, an hour and a bit down the highway in Kitchener, Ontario, which is kind of a smaller town. So it was, it was a weird B-City tour vibe to it. But it was the biggest one. So, yeah, cool. Well, that would have been fun. That's, that sounds like a good time. Yeah, anytime you're involved in something like that, it's just a, a bit of music history, right? That's that's to a lot of us. That's a, that's always a big deal. All right, so the next uh, band I'm going to talk about here <clears throat> is Dream Theater. So the, Martin and I talked uh, got a couple episodes ago. I don't remember what the topic was. But we were talking about how certain fan bases will dissect and get really, really nerdy when it comes to certain bands. So we talked about the metal side of that, which was Iron Maiden. So Iron, you know, Iron Maiden, a new album comes out. The new, the, they set up a new tour the fan base just like up in arms ready and willing to dissect and destroy and just twist about and you know all aspects of the albums and the songs and the set list for the tours and so i mean it, it's real nerdy shit right really really nerdy stuff people really get into the weeds with certain bands so on the metal side you have iron maiden yeah. more on the prog and prog metal side you have a band named dream theater and again, Dream Theater, you know, another thing, too, that we even haven't touched on is that some of these bands, if they play maybe more metal music, but they really, their influences are more on the prog side. Maiden's a perfect example of that, you know, Bruce Dickinson, Steve Harrison have always talked about how they grew up listening to Yes and Genesis and Jethro Tull and all that kind of stuff. All of a sudden, to the fan base, well, that's cool. This metal band likes the prog stuff. Maybe I should be listening to prog because I don't want to miss out on this. Same thing with Dream Theater. So Dream Theater... If you listen to interviews with Mike Portnoy, John Petrucci, and you know the rest of the band, they grew up on a steady diet of Metallica and Deep Purple and Rush, right? Sp specifically Rush and Yes and Genesis and and Rainbow and all these sort of bands. So this whole like kind of cornucopia of influences to then create this music, which you know arguably one of the first um, mainstream progressive metal bands, you know, <clears throat> Fate's Warning probably came before them in Queensryche, you could argue there as well, too. But I think for the music, you know, when, when this first came out, when Dream and Day Unite, most of us were saying, oh my God, that's like kind of like Rush on steroids, right? And then they break into the big time with uh, images and words. And with I a lot realized of these- I, I'm wearing a Rush on steroids shirt <laughs> here, too. That's there you I go, Voivod, <laughs> another perfect example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Another great example. Uh, and, you know, and and these guys, this is, you know, metal music, but it's got pop hooks, long songs, lots of soloing, lots of intricate parts. You know, the lyrical content is oh, is most of the time fairly conceptual. I mean, you know, some of that pulled out just a handful of their albums. Uh, you know, then they go out and do this album, Train of Thought, which is basically like their uh, And Justice for All or, you know, Master of Puppets type album. It's mostly metal. Um, like I said, epic length tracks, high attention to detail and productions. Um, it's proggy, it's metal, there's bits of pop. Uh, and, you know, the guys in the band, they're influenced by all the same stuff that we are. But, you know, the the level of detail to, and again, they don't do it as much anymore. And, you know, Mike Portnoy was mainly the guy responsible for this, but like they would go out and if every tour... They would meticulously pick specific songs from the catalog to play live. And during rehearsals for the tour, they would go out and they would learn like 60 songs from their catalog. And then every night would play a different set list. I mean, that's really ridiculous. And, and when you think about it, that any band would go to such lengths. I know the Grateful Dead did that for many, many years. But in this context, it's really crazy. And, you know, with that, you get like, I think I've shown this before, but, uh, you know, Mike Portnoy sent me this Dream Theater Box of Doom set, right? So here you have, they had the fan club. If you are part of the fan club, you get, you know, exposure to all these releases where, you know, Pink Floyd, I mean, the Dream Theater playing Dark Side of the Moon live, right? There's a DVD of that. Um, them playing uh, Master of Puppets. I have that here too. Uh, 
where's it, where's it, where's it? Anyway, uh, there's all sorts of stuff here, you know, them playing the number of the beast, right? Again, showing their influence, right? We, we love prog, we love metal. And most metal fans, the metal fans who don't like long songs and things like that probably shy away from Dream Theater a little bit, but I know you go to any Dream Theater concert, you'll find the hardcore prog fans and metal fans in attendance. And but again, the kind of like the nitpickiness and the obsession over the band's music is really, really high and really, really nerdy. And I think that that's, uh, you know, one of the things, again, I, I always liken Iron Maiden and Dream Theater in that aspect. I think that the, the audiences are so passionate, but yet they kind of cross over because there's a lot of prog fans who like uh, Iron Maiden as well. And I think for, you know, for Dream Theater, again, they kind of fall into this progressive metal camp which is a little bit of both but you get people from both who maybe don't listen to a lot of prog metal but listen to dream theater and maybe prog fans who don't listen to much prog metal but listen to dream theater so anyway uh yeah that's that's my take yeah yeah you know and and this this one was chosen to represent to get back to ben's question i mean this was chosen to represent uh a, a, that overlap between prog and metal but we also wanted to, to stress that that um, it, you know, this is a band that is absolutely treated on a scholarly level by the fans. So you get the other overlap is that prog fans and metal fans um, are very are very scholarly and super serious about their bands and want to learn everything. And there's there's lots and lots written and said about them. And both and in both cases, I remember people saying this in the early days of the of the internet. Um, people were saying that the early days of the internet, when it came to music coverage, heavy metal was leaps and bounds ahead of most genres. There was lots and lots and lots of discussion of heavy metal. So I would almost lean to give heavy metal more credit for being for for taking up more uh server space uh you know in in the world um when it comes to music coverage and then prog fans are pretty close as well so they're very similar in that way i mean yeah i mean that's a good point so look like case in point so and we'll go back in time a little bit to and well you know today vinyl is popular once again today but go back to like the 70s or the 80s you know a new album comes out from a Iron Maiden or a Judas Priest or a Yes or a Dream Theater or, who, or Rush or whoever it might be, what did most of us do? We would get that album, we would pour over the lyrics and read the lyrics and the liner notes, where was it produced, who produced it, what instruments did each guy play and whatnot, and that's that was normal, right? That's just what you do. I mean, how many people who buy a Madonna record or a Taylor Swift record or whatever really give a shit about all that stuff, right? They don't. They just they just yeah. want to hear the songs. So both, I think both metal fans and prog fans are attention to the little details that go into the making of this music and these albums is, is of great interest to us. That's why Martin has had a great career writing books about all this stuff because people want to know all this stuff, right? For, yeah. for these two types of music. And I think that will always be the case when you talk about these two styles of music as opposed to a lot of other things. Yeah, and you'd go read the books they talked about or watch the movies they talked about as well, yeah. right? So all yeah. that. All right. So my last one, again, it's book day. Uh, my big hardcover, Your Eye Heap. I still have these, the big uh, coffee table book. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, the idea with Heap, again, to answer Ben's question, you go back to, um, you know, specifically this, these represent the whole thing with the early Roger Dean artwork. Yeah. Um, you've, you've got a band that I've often argued, you know, if, if I was in a argumentative mood and, and uh, was want to say that Rush didn't invent progressive metal, you can almost say that your eye Heap have a big hand in that as well with the long songs, the conceptual stuff, the demons and wizards stuff. So again, um, you know, leaning towards the, you know, they even cause, they even cause demons and wizards. So this, this is, uh, I took this out to represent the idea that um, if, if you don't buy the argument that Uri Heap invented progressive metal, you can almost put them in, in the Uri Heap invented power metal camp. And then that takes us to the whole, um, progressive rock, progressive metal, power metal, and power metal and progressive metal kind of go together. And you you lean into the whole symphonic metal thing. Uh, Labyrinth, you've got the whole Italian thing going, you know, Rhapsody or Rhapsody of Fire. You know, this is all this is all sort of direct, uh, uh, directly from the whole Uriah Heap thing and, and power metal. Dio, um, uh, 
rainbow. Um, you know, yeah. Ura Heap begats rainbow, you know, Deep Purple begats rainbow as well, but Heap is in there as well. So, uh, you know, to, to, to answer Ben's question, where is the overlap? The overlap is big in your eye heap as well. But again, uh, the open mindedness, um, you know, metalheads, I think, love heap more than progressive uh, fans love heap. Um, and yet uh, that, you know, th they offer things from both. But yeah, so I, I've always I've always liked that question of, uh, you know, can we say your eye heap is is because they come before rush, they do all their main work, even before rush kind of gets going They're the work everybody talks about, you know, five or six studio albums before rush in 74. Um, you know, are they, are they the true uh, inventors with songs like magician's birthday of, uh, of, uh, progressive metal? Yeah. And I think too, I think that prog fans are much more picky when it comes to which of the right heap albums they will choose to say i like that right i think mm -hmm. demons and wizards and magician's birthday maybe even salisbury because salisbury has the big long you know epic title track i think those are the albums yeah. that most of the prog fans kind of target when they're talking about the heap albums that are prog rock worthy so to speak right mm -hmm. yeah. that, that fit the mold all right, so my last one for today is uh, this whole topic of extreme metal, progressive death metal, symphonic black metal, technical death metal, that sort of thing, right? I would just kind of pick a couple bands here that kind of, mm -hmm. kind of uh, we can center on here. So there's a musicality and virtuosity aspect of some of this music that i think that uh you know any, any prog or metal fan would be attracted to because i think that musicality is like first and foremost that's i think why a lot of us listen to this music and there are lots of metal bands who play a more extreme form of music which incorporate harsh vocals whether they be growling death metal growls the raspier shrieks of black metal or the more guttural bellowing aspect of maybe like kind of like hardcore or whatnot and some are or you know or the, the the kind of the gruff vocals of thrash that sort of thing uh and that can be a turnoff to a lot of non-metal fans I, I know that's generally speaking i've talked to tons of prog fans over the years who like oh i really like the music but i can't get past those vocals and I think for some, there, for myself, I'll use myself as an example. There was a time where I was in the same camp, kind of. And I grew up listening to Possessed and Death right off the bat when they came out. But then, like, over the years, once, like, death metal and black metal really started to rise to prominence, I was kind of like, you know, the full-on assault of that. I was kind of like, I'm not sure if I really enjoy this or not. And sometimes it takes a band that incorporates other elements that will make you all of a sudden look past those vocals and get used to those vocals because everything else is so exquisite. Uh, case in point, my first uh, example here is Opeth from Sweden. I almost talked about Opeth in the uh, the Dream Theater segment because they're, they have a very nerdy audience who, again, dissects everything they do, but I think they fit more here. So here on these early Opeth albums, You've got this full-on raging death metal, but the music is so complicated and gorgeous, incorporating elements of folk and prog and 70s hard rock and, of course, metal and death metal. Uh, and then they go and do an album like Damnation, which is full-on prog and Mellotron and acoustic guitars. And then they do the same year they deliver Deliverance, Deliver Deliverance, uh, which is, you know, full-on death metal. And, uh, you know, again, they start to soften their stance eventually they give up all the uh, the death metal aspects of their music and they've become like a basically a 70s prog and hard rock band at this point in time and you know you've got the early fans who don't want to hear them doing this style and then the prog fans who wouldn't listen to the death metal opeth now love the non-death metal opeth right so this is a band that i think that has really divided the audiences big time but you again you've got people from both camps who are fully listening to this band. Uh, also, I think another band that uh, a lot of folks from both prog and metal really enjoy quite a bit is Gojira. And again, their, their vocals are not as harsh as others, but the music is so complicated from a rhythmic and uh, guitar perspective 
that I think people have really grown to love these guys because, again, they kind of, they, there's a little bit of psychedelia, there's a little bit of thrash in here. They're not really anything. They're not a death metal band. They're not a black metal band. They're, they're not a classic metal band. They kind of do a little bit of both. People tend to call them prog metal, but I, you know, sometimes I kind of struggle with that too. But I think their music is accessible enough and complicated enough that prog fans have really latched onto these guys. But again, Martin, I think it has a little bit to do with the fact that the vocals are not quite crossing that line because there is that line, right? I mean, that that full on death metal growl to a lot of uh, prog fans is, is a bit too much, a bit too much to hold. Um, and a, a couple other bands that also kind of do the same thing, uh, Enslaved. I mean, these albums that Enslaved have been putting out for the last decade plus are, you know, they're a prog lover's dream. But, you know, there's those harsh black metal vocals mixed with the clean vocals. It's a little too much for some, but others have embraced it. Uh, Emperor, one of the first bands that started doing this whole symphonic black metal thing with loads of keyboards, gorgeous keyboard soundscapes. But again, the vocals can be a wall for some people. But I think that a lot of the metal fans like the progginess of these guys because it is something different. I think, you know, to to mix extreme metal with symphonic progressive rock, I think at the time, back in the early mid 90s, that was something new. Uh, and then real quickly, you got, you know, bands like Nea Blue Scaris, who are doing some really cool psychedelic and prog and symphonic things within an extreme metal framework. You got uh, Obscura, who, have, who add like highly complex uh arrangements jazz fusion guitar solos and proggy arrangements and juggernaut uh you know death metal it's you know and, and a lot of that can be you know gone back to the early death albums you know death with the human album first started to really incorporate like progressive rock elements and jazz fusion elements especially in the guitar solos the drumming and the arrangements to the point where their latter albums are just gorgeously complex and uh, even though they still are death metal albums they're just really really uh beautifully arranged and the musicality is just absolutely absolutely off the charts but again uh it goes back to our original point here is i i think that metal fans are more susceptible to accept progressive tendencies in metal bands than prog rock fans willing to listen to this sort of thing because there's something there's one thing one aspect of the music that maybe is a turnoff and and there's a block there, right? There's there's the wall that goes up, and I'm not going to venture into that. Not everybody. We're not talking about everybody, but but a good number of people. Yeah, a couple of points I want to make. So so one small point that's arguable is that you know sometimes, you know, you can imagine a prog fan just saying, "I got enough to listen to. I don't need to try to to do this stuff right. that, that's hard on my ears and fatiguing." There literally is enough to fill all my leisure hours as much of it as I want to fill with music anyway. So that's one weird point. The other weird point is um, I, I remember Stephen Wilson telling me this years and years ago, he, he said uh, heavy metal is the new progressive rock. And there's something really deep about that because as time goes on, I swear to God, I, I had, I had one of these out to, you know, to, to mention God, um, you know, lamb of God it definitely fits in this and all, all your mas mastodon of, of course, as well yeah, uh, yeah. fits this right as, as two famous examples. But um, you know, you listen to today's metal or or one form of today's most modern metal there is, even a band like Baby Metal. I mean, a, a lot of metal these days has uh, has almost like seamlessly um, incorporated a, a large chunk of Meshuggah gent in it. Right. Um, so you listen to you listen to today's metal and you think of young kids processing this stuff. It is way more progressive than any progressive rock that you could even bring up. And, and this is, has been going on since the days of death. I mean, it's, it's, this has been going on for years, right? I mean, even, even with Megadeth, you could go back to, to you know, the early days of Megadeth, them trying to do this. Right. But yeah. as time has gone on um, it's almost like, um, Oh yeah, I can, I can listen to this. I can groove to this and, and, and whatever, whatever form of a mosh pit is these days. But, but the crazy, the crazy uh, element of this, like I said, we, we've been born and bred into it for years and years. Swedish progressive death all along the way. You know, certain things black metal would do. And, you know, you brought up Emperor. You think of Ishan with Picatum. And actually, that's another point I wanted to make before I get back to this is the whole idea of, um, you know, uh, some metal bands themselves, as as with Enslaved, you've got Kurt Vanderhoof starts with Metal Church, ends up with 
this pro you know, progressive. You think of sabotage starting with this and ending up with, uh, you know, these more proggy albums. For sure. Yeah. And then even TSO. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of these metal guys gravitate to prog like Opeth and Michael Ackerfeld. Right. Um, but I, I think the most important point to make here, which is which is the coolest thing in, in terms of looking at Ben's question is uh, I feel like kids nowadays and, you know, most of them probably aren't even players, but just metal fans nowadays um, just almost subconsciously are absorbing on a regular basis the most progressive metal that's ever existed. And it blows away all progressive rock in terms of progressiveness. I mean, what you're asked to absorb in, in modern extreme metal these days is so incredibly crazy rhythmic. I mean, literally it, you know, we, when, when Meshuggah first came out, we went, that's crazy. And, you know, and they kept, they kept doing it. Right. Yeah. But nowadays that level of craziness of, of Meshuggah, you know, granted it's, it's tamed down a tiny bit, um, to make it a little more musical and sensible, but that that thing Meshuggah kind of started is just right. You know, it's it's a Tuesday in today's metal. It's just like regular, and 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 kids are absorbing it. So so I think the most attuned progressive rock fans who are listening to the most progressive things these days are just your garden variety metalheads. Yeah, I mean, I think it had a lot. It has a lot to do with. <clears throat> what you grew up with and what you gravitated towards 50 years ago, 45, 50 years ago, because uh, a case in point, I was listening yesterday to the new Avenged Sevenfold album. Mm -hmm. Martin, there's shit going on that album. I don't know if I've ever heard before. <laughs> I mean, I'm listening to this. I'm like, holy, what are these guys doing? You know, some of it I liked, some of it I didn't like, but I was like, but, but the first thing that came to mind is like, wow, this is next level shit. You know, There's you supposed normally... to be a mainstream band, right? Right, it, it, 100%, right? And I'm like, I'm listening to this. I'm like, holy, this is like this weird meeting of like kind of Frank Zappa and Mr. Bungle and Dream Theater, but like amped up to 15. And I'm like, this is like unlike any, and again, some of it, I, like I said, some of it, I was like, this is really cool. Some of this, kind of, oh, I don't know. They're they're going places I don't even know if I, my brain can can occupy. But then, you know, you look, you think of that and then you go back and, and, and compare it to like an album that came out, you know, like 45, 50 years ago, that's beloved by longtime prog fans. I'll just uh, relayer by yes. Right. We, we normally think of relayer as this highly complicated, complex, you know, work of yes. And then you, you listen to the two of them side by side. And granted, Event Sevenfold doesn't sound anything like yes. I'm not trying to say that. But you listen to the progressiveness of both of those albums. And it's hard to ignore the fact that the Event Sevenfold album is going places that yes, never ever thought to go, right? Yeah. I think mean, that's the point we're trying to make here. But there's a lot of people who are yes fans for fifty plus years that would never give an Event Sevenfold album a time of day, right? Yeah. But yet it's maybe even put it down, music. right? Oh, they're they're not as musical as yes, you know. Right. They, there's no songs here and stuff like that. They would right, say, right? right? Yeah. yeah, and and there's no soul in uh in this playing and yet jimmy page is so soulful right yeah kind of thing right yeah yeah so we're you know we're not putting down one over the other here we're just trying to uh kind of make a point to, to ben's suggestion that uh, i think sometimes that one audience is a little bit more open to things than the other might be and there's probably people that are watching that don't fall into that category and that's fine uh, we're not saying that everybody does but i think that yeah. there's there's a lot to really love in different forms of heavy metal that some prog fans are just not willing to venture into. And, and I get it. If you still want to listen to the same PFM and yes, and Genesis albums that you've listened to for 50 years and you don't really want to listen to anything new, that's your prerogative, right? So yeah. there's really nothing we can do there. Yeah. It's there's something I, br I bring up here sometimes too. It's like, it's like, you take you take uh say rush caress of steel and and you you got to give them credit for for you know mm -hmm. being the first to break whatever 100 yard dash record that was yeah. set at that point but then avenge sevenfold is is you know five generations on and they're still they're still you know shaving uh tensor hundreds of a second off that quarter or that 100 yard dash record right yeah. um so you know you know neil peart is is a is a god for being there first and then people were first before you know john bonham was first in various ways before him and ginger baker was first before him but you know 
you know, these Prague people have to, they have to admit that, uh, that, you know, there, there are drummers these days that could play circles around the old guys. Um, you know, they have, they have 20 extra things they could do that those old guys couldn't do. Yeah. I will say one thing. Uh, and again, being a Prague fan for as long as I have, we tend to be very loyal, right. To a fault sometimes, because it's, mm-hmm. it's, I think a lot of people I talk to are like, it's this small little universe and there's nothing outside of that. <clears throat> and we can only listen to and love these guys, these bands, these albums. Uh, you know, there's a lot more out there as well. There's nothing wrong with loving and cherishing that stuff. Trust me, because I, I do. Um, but, you know, there's a, you're, you're absolutely right there. There are guys that came before and after. Right. It's not yeah. just the music didn't stop from 1970 to 1977. Right. It's there's. A lot of stuff outside of that little bubble. Yeah. I'll mention one more thing along this, this line of uh, how, um, you know, there's overlap Ben because, uh, because uh, metalheads uh, discover Prague or want to do Prague later. And and another interesting example of that is, uh, is you've got, you know, did Richie Blackmore go a little Prague with rising? Did Roger Glover go a little Prague with elements? I mean, I mean, uh, John Lord with Elements. Did Roger Glover go a little prog with Butterfly Ball? Did Ian Gillen go a little prog with the Ian Gillen band? Yeah, um, yeah. you know. So, so it's funny how how you know a, a lot of our our guys we we can we can think back and say you know they they all kind of wanted to try prog at some point, so they liked prog, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And we haven't mentioned the elephant in the room. I think both prog and metal fans like drugs. Yeah. <laughs> so there is that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Uh, well, before I, I, I promised we would have another little uh, bonus uh, in this episode. So I, I kind of want to end this album, this album, this uh, show on a little bit of a rant. And I want to kind of give a little explanation. So I've been noticing over the last couple of months. And, and I know Martin will back me up here because Martin and I have both been journalists for a long, long time. When it comes to like the big releases, right? There is this expectation among the viewership or fans in general that when a new album from a very notable band comes out, they want a review from folks like Martin and myself, like the day it's out or before it comes out or really soon thereafter. And my perception of that is because they love the band. Maybe they bought the album too and they really like it. And they want a validation on, you know, why they love it so much. They want us to love it too. And it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it does. So I've been seeing a lot of late because, you know, a lot of what I do here on the channel, and of course, the web zine is we review albums, right? New albums. That's what we do. It's why we've been doing this for all these years. But like, I've noticed that people get very, very persistent and impatient. They want to review like the day the album comes out. And I think that folks fail to realize that just like all of you, we need to digest these albums too. And there's a reason why I generally don't do a review the day the album comes out, because in most cases, I mean, I've got 50 to 70 albums I got to listen to on a regular basis here anyway. In most cases, I can't get to it right away. I try very hard to. And in most cases, you got to give me at least three, four, five spins of these things. I mean, that's just the way it works. So case in point, I reviewed The Extreme the other day. Fairly soon after it came out. I mean, it came out last Friday. I reviewed it on Wednesday. I had enough time to listen to it a bunch of times. I gave my review. Uh, and then you get two camps, right? Because I, I noticed it with the, the the Metallica album. I noticed it with the Jeff Rotel. A couple other big ones that have come out in recent, you know, the Sinjutsu from Iron Maiden last year. You have these bands that are highly controversial, very popular. Everybody nitpicks over their albums. Either you got one camp that's going to hate it no matter what, and all they want to do is see people like you and I trash it because it's no good. They haven't made a good album in 30 years. And then the other camp that worships these bands, and no matter what they do, it's a 10 out of 10 classic, right? So I gave this a three out of five. The first half of it, I really like. I don't know if you heard it, Martin. The second half oh, yeah. Yeah. is pretty lackluster for me. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't need to listen to a 20. I go two and a half out of five. <laughs> you gave it two and a half. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, what I like is really good, but half of the album is pretty uninspired and just kind of bland and boring. But yet there are so many people who are like calling people like Martin and me out because we're not declaring this the absolute classic that they think it is. 
And it's like, again, I go back to the whole thing of, we all hear things differently, right? You guys want people like Martin and I to give our perceptions, our expert take, whatever, on these albums. Folks, we don't have the luxury of listening to this for two months and then giving a review because two months from now, nobody's going to care about this anymore. We literally have like a week to two weeks in most cases to get on a review of a, of a notable release like this. And then we've got 50 other albums to listen to. So, you know, we, we just don't have the luxury of, of spending months and months and months with these things. That's just the way it works. But you can, you can expect that we will give it our full undivided attention for however many times we can get a listen in, whether it's two, five, 10, within the span of a week or two after it comes out to review it. And if you don't agree with our review, that's fine. You know, it's there. Are, I've, Seen remarks from people who the songs that I call that is not being very good. They think they're the best songs on the album. That's going to be like that for every release. Um, so yeah, you guys, you know, have to understand that like we just we don't have the luxury of yeah. I saw a bunch of comments like, well, you probably should have reviewed this after you it sat with you for a couple of months. Nobody's going to care about a review of this in August or September. That's just the, the facts. That's the facts. Yeah. When we do it in this line of work. We have to review these things and be as timely as possible. And that's just the way it is. And, you know, it's, I tell you, I'll tell you this. I had a week with this too. And the difference between this and this is this is a better album, in my view. You may not agree, and that's okay. To me, The Rival Sons is a better release. Stronger through and through, there's really good stuff on here. It's not a very strong album. And for those who are saying, well, but, you know, you should know that Extreme likes to do lots of various types of music and they cross multiple genres. Yeah, I'm well aware of that. Three Sides to Every Story is my favorite Extreme album. There's no album that has more variants on it than that one. So I fully get that. I appreciate that about Extreme. The problem is the songs that go off into different tangents on here are just not all that memorable. And to me, they're not all that good. Martin, I don't know if you want to say a few things. Yeah, so I, I don't do as many reviews as you. I'm going to probably start doing a few more on the Contrarians um, because, you know, it, it was it was a good experience getting the Metallica done. But the funny thing that happens with me is that because I really don't do that many reviews anymore, a big album comes out and I'm constantly getting people just asking me one on one in Facebook and Messenger emails. What do you think of the new whatever album? Right. And it's now I have to write a mini review for them every single time to, yeah. to, to, yeah. And that, that gets like, okay, I'm, I, I have this standard thing that I tell people when they ask I, the, the worst question I hate getting asked is somebody emails me and says, how do I make a book? Right. I mean, that question just sends, it just ruins my day. Right. Because like, oh, what do I write this guy back? Right. Because my, my standard line is, I write too little, you're ticked off. I write too much, I'm ticked off, right? I mean, I, I, could, I could spend hours and hours and hours writing you an answer and then you're going to have 20 more questions, right? Um, this is just going to go on and on sort of thing. So, so the, the funny thing I've noticed happen is uh, I'm really happy with myself when as soon as that album comes out, I get a review out there so I can just say, go here, go here, go here. That's what I think, right? Um, and it's way better than I'm going to give you in three lines in an email back to you, right? Yeah. Um, but I've I've been in situations like um, that I've kind of regretted. Um, I had to I had to review the ACDC Power Up album. It took so much work getting adv an advanced copy of that thing. Um, you know, all these hoops I had to jump through to get this advanced copy, and then Banger Films, which is a it was a high profile place that the review was going to happen they needed it like three hours later after i got my advanced thing so i literally had to listen to it and do my review inside of like a few hours kind of thing right and then you know and that's what i would have liked to reflect it on i i did a banger review senjutsu as well i'm a little different than you though i i think and i i shouldn't admit this because it's not good but um i generally can review an album by a band that I know really, really well and pretty much get it right in less than one play of it. Like literally I won't even play the whole thing through. I can just jump through it. And I know exactly my, my opinion on that extreme course ain't going to change. You know, I hate it. I know I'm going to hate it. 
two months from now. Right. Um, you know, I, I, there were a lot of complaints I had with the extreme. I just wasn't happy with the, all those, like you say, the tangents, um, are not tangents. You or I want them to go down. Uh, and that's kind of what happened with that extreme album. Right. And then, and then, so here's another bad thing about me is like, I was going to do an, a, a review of the extreme album, but I was so bummed out by it. I never even went and did one. So I thought, oh, I'll do, I'll do one of these for contrarians. What the heck? Right. You know, the Metallica was, you know, got a lot of views and all that. And, and it got that off my plate. So, so here's my good review of it. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it is, it is funny. I will, uh, I will, um, do that um I'll, I'll mention one more really embarrassing story that i think i've said before it's so funny though um i remember reviewing i you i probably told you this before but it's ridiculous this story so i remember reviewing a megadeth album one time for brave words right and uh, what had happened i in my office which i had in the house before this is years and years ago so we had an extra bedroom in the house that I had my office in. And I had this big ghetto blaster sitting on the side of my desk in the computer and stuff. And uh, in the interim, the power had gone off and come back on, right? So now I got to review this Megadeth album. I'm putting it in the thing and playing it. And it had knocked all the bass and treble settings to zero. And I had no idea it had done this, right? So I'm playing this. And I swear to God, in my review, it got in there that this album sounds like crap. Right. But production's horrible. There's no Oops. bottom end on this. There's no treble on this album. And it's like I later discover, oh, just bass, 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 bass. Oops, treble, maybe that's a good review. Past halfway, <laughs> past three quarters way, you know, to where I usually have it's like, oh, actually, this all sounds really good now. So, uh, that was just hilarious, right? So uh, there's not much you can do about that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh but no, I, I really don't play albums very much before. I if they're a band I've grown up with since I was a kid, I know immediately what I'm going to think of this with, uh, with you know, 40 seconds of each song, right? It's kind of all you need uh, in, in some cases. So, but yeah, you're right. We have to jump on them right away. No one cares after a while. And then everybody thinks you're just, you're just uh, behind the times if you don't get to it or unorganized yeah. or something, right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I will say too, for everybody watching, I mean, you know, I'm a fan. I, I really like extreme a lot. So don't think that I go into these reviews wanting to slag any of this stuff. You know, the same thing with Metallica. I went in with an open mind. I really wanted to like the Metallica album and I liked a good chunk of it. Right. I mean, I thought I gave that a, a you know, a fairly somewhat positive review. And it's the same thing with this. It's like, I really wanted to love this whole thing because I, the, the couple songs that they released beforehand, I really liked. Unfortunately, the rest of the album is like, it's like they released the best stuff first and the rest of the album doesn't live up to it and that's just and you know there's no 10 more listens is going to make me change that opinion so did i want this to be a four out of five star album yeah it's a three a three is, is yeah. good right it's you know it's not great it reminds me of another story so i so again another high profile review this is back when i was doing reviews for banger um <clears throat> i had to review the d snyder album right I gave this long, glowing, complicated review of this thing. I don't know how long I was talking about this one album. It must have been half an hour, 25 minutes, something like that. Big, long, positive review. I get to the end, I, I thought, you know, almost almost spontaneously, I thought, oh, man, we always give everything fours and fives. You know, I'm, I the, something does bother me about this. It's really, really good, but it's that kind of good that's too perfect. And I'm not happy that D didn't write the lyrics. I want to hear his lyrics. He's led, led an interesting life. So I gave it a three out of five. D D like goes off on me. He thinks he thinks. Yeah. So D was not happy with me. I don't think D likes me to this day because I gave his album a three out of five. And it's like, well, D, did you listen to the thing? I was like, I was basically calling you a rock God through this whole review. Right. I mean, it was a very positive and a thoughtful review, I thought. And then at the end, I go three out of five. Right. And it's that's like, why sometimes the rating can be an issue. Right. Yeah, I, I had this whole conversation with David Gallagher. He tells me he told me that on his channel, he does not give anything a rating specifically for that because, yeah, you're you're right, because you can. And the Metallica was a perfect example. I mean, most of my review was pretty positive. And I, you know, the couple points that I made that weren't, I made them. But, you know, everybody looks at well, well, what you're rating. Right. And then there's this perception that three point five or three out of five is not good. When in actuality, for me, if it's 2.52 or less, 
that's then you're going into the not good category. But you know, three I think is good. Three point five is very solid. Four and above, that's a really good album. A really good album. Yeah. So, but people, yeah, they get very nitpicky about that stuff, and it's like sometimes I think we trap ourselves because we have to give this rating, and it's like, but I, I could totally see your point. It's like when, once you start, even though your Snyder review was probably really glowing when you look at the whole content of what you delivered those couple of points that you made that were maybe that probably knocked it down a little bit and made more sense to, to give the rating that you did. Yeah. I mean, we went through this at the magazine all the time at brave words and bloody knuckles. Every issue had like 50, 60 reviews in it. Yeah. Right. And Tim was always like hammering on us. It's like, and, and I was, I had to edit all the reviews. It's like, we were telling everybody, come on, man, not everything's an eight or a nine. Come on. Yeah. You know, we're all fans of this stuff, but we got it. We got to show some discipline here and show some range sort of thing. And it was just a, a constant thing that was always happening. Right. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard. I get that here, too, on the channel. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, Pete loves every album that he reviews. No, I don't. Right. But when I do give something a little bit less of a score, people are in an uproar about it. Right. So it's like you can't have both guys. You got we're, we're being honest here with how we perceive these albums. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm I'm pretty open to a lot of stuff. And, you know, I review a lot of things that I do like quite a bit, but they're there's plenty that come up that I'm like, okay, I, I dig it, but I don't love it. And here's why. And so not everything can be a four out of five or a five out of five. And some stuff is okay. It's pretty good, but you know, a three or 3.5, that, that's what you get. That's, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I think we beat this rant to death. So, uh, Hope you enjoyed the show, everybody. We uh, went all over the place here. But again, I think the, the gist of the whole episode is, and we'd love to hear from you folks watching, is, you know, if you are someone who appreciates and loves both prog and metal, what are the reasons why you think you do? And if you're in one camp versus the other, what reservations do you have about heavy metal music if you're a prog fan? And what reservations if you're a metal fan do you have about prog music? What don't you like? What what limits you to crossing over and really fully enjoying the other genres? So, we, you know, potentially we got three groups of people here, Martin, who will chime in hopefully and tell us what their experience with these two uh music genres that we love so much here on Sea of Tranquility because they are the main driving force of this channel. So Ben, thank you for the question we re uh, for the uh the uh, suggestion we really appreciate it. We got a whole show out of it. So Martin, uh update on uh what's going on with uh books, contrarians, podcast, all that sort of thing. Anything new coming out? Yeah, check check out the audio podcast, History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff, up to 207 episodes. The last one was about grunge requiems. Um and then, yeah, we got the video channel Contrarians and uh, all my books are at uh, martinpopoff.com. Coming up here on the channel, we've got uh, later today, three o'clock, uh, Ken Golden will be joining me for our weekly program where he will be talking about some of the new releases that are coming out in Prague and Fusion and uh, Progressive Metal, Power Metal. So uh, and all of that stuff will be available at the Laser's Edge uh, website. So check out that episode at three o'clock today. We've also got tomorrow the UK Connection. So Simon and Stephen will be joining me. We'll be uh, talking about our favorite and least favorite albums from Ozzy Osbourne's solo catalog. And then Sunday, George Lemie and Eric Porter will be joining me for a ranking of the albums of the great uh, fusion band from Derek Sherinian and Virgil Donati called Planet X. So that'll be coming up on Sunday. And uh, stay tuned next Friday for Friday morning to Funhouse. Martin and I will be talking about uh, examples of non-English language music. Right. Martin, I don't know. You want to give a little bit more uh, of a preview to that? Yeah, I think I think we're going to include some English language stuff in there, but it it's bands from the non the, the four Australia, Canada, uh, the States and Britain, the, the non, you know, mainly English speaking uh, countries and uh, what we get out of them and what we don't like uh, from those bands. Yeah. And we'll be have, we'll be giving examples of bands that sing in their native tongue what it's like to kind of incorporate that for the English speaking public, as well as those bands who sing in English, but English is not their first language and that whole accent uh, thing and how that works. So we'll have examples of both and uh, we'll be talking about that next week here at the Funhouse. So stay tuned for that. This is on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube all together all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alert of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave. Also down below in the video description, we've got the links to our Ko-Fi page as well as our merch page where you can get all sorts of cool 
see a tranquility gear like this uh great mixtape challenge shirt we got one for prog and for metal speaking of right another example of that uh you can also create your own mixtape shirt as well there's information on the uh on the website for all that so uh thanks for watching everybody from martin popoff imp pardo have a great weekend uh we'll see you later on with more stuff and next week here at the funhouse take care bye-bye